Hi there, get ready to listen to Dan's first mentor session. Hear about the company, Dan's suggestions and ideas and encouragements and also challenges and see if it helps your business also. Right, enjoy. So it'd be great to know a little bit about you, a little bit about your background and and uh, your business and specifically uh, where you want assistance with. I recognize we only have half an hour for this session. So um, yeah, if we don't cover everything, it's completely fine because we've we've got, you know, four sessions in total. Um, so yeah, this can be the first one. So it might be a little bit more just getting to know you and that's okay. There'll, yeah. there'll be more kind of usefulness coming up in the next few sessions. So yeah, the floor's all yours. So as a professional, I started as a nurse and then I ended up working in the call centers. Um, I'm from India. Um, I've lived in this country for, I think it's coming up to my 11th year. Um, and so I moved into the call centers because that was the boom at that time. And then um, I don't know if this is relevant, but I'm just going with it. So you yeah. just know that like my kind of journey. Um, yeah. If, I, I suppose the, the point, the reason why I mentioned the nursing thing, uh, and I always do it though, it's not relevant to my current working. It's just to demonstrate that when things don't work or whatever, I'm quite flexible to changing things because I did a five-year nursing course and I, I was working as an orthopedic, um, uh, what do you call it, surgery nurse. But my only option was to either leave India and move abroad to make money because the nurses in India were not getting paid much, but I didn't want yeah. to leave my mom at that time. I stayed there. So I switched to the call centers and yeah, I just tooted along till my third, till my third, late twenties and 30, mm. uh, just as I was reaching, I had a, like a 30 year moment. Um, and I, um, joined Accenture. I don't know if you've heard of Accenture. Yes, I have. Yeah. yeah. So they had a massive uh, outsourcing thing in India, um, mm -hmm. the call center. So I joined there, and from there, kind of my career kicked off in quality quality management. Uh, I was their quality supervisor for their Asia Pacific area, and kind of grew from there. Um, and then that's when my family, we moved to, to the UK. But then that meant I had to start again. <laughs> yeah. So it was like I came to this point, but I was fortunate. I got a job at ADT Fund Security as their quality manager mm. for their contact center. I worked mm. there and then I moved to Lancashire and I've worked for Lancashire Women for seven years, which is a... a charity for Lancashire women um, mm -hmm. but that was part of their journey to really grow the organization so they were like uh, I think there were 10 or 15 people and they did small projects uh, locally and by the time I finished I'd like to say I helped them with the systems and processes and uh, the means to kind of uh, become uh, a supplier uh, on the you know supply chain for the Ministry of Justice, probation, the local council, um, the local CCGs and stuff. They so they because it's quite hard for a community charity to to get uh, onto that kind of a framework. And yes, uh, they were quite successful because they you know I implemented like the CRM, the IT, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so broad kind of operations um, yeah, in some respects. Data, data impact um, and all that kind of, a, you know, developing teams. Yeah, all the stuff which usually in the charity sector nobody likes to do. Because yeah. they go to the charity sector because you get to be passionate about the, you know, like the working with people or working for the cause. Mm. And usually they're not quite, keen on the boring recording and reporting and all that but I love yes. all that stuff so that's what I um, enjoyed great and because 
the charity kind of a like get a free rein to do like, there's not much red tape so you kind of uh, you know i was the decision maker as well as the implementer at points so it was just quite easy to to say yes to myself and get on with it um, sounds good yeah but then last year in september 2020 there was a lot of changes happening as was because of the pandemic and mm. there was all sorts happening when i decided i wanted to start my own business mm. and i've been toying with this idea for a long time but um i decided to take the plunge because i had just done a leadership program with close social uh, leadership um i don't know if you've heard of them they do leadership programs for the social sector um and it, it kind of gave me the space to think and reflect on what i really wanted to do and i found that i'm quite good with coaching and mentoring especially women from my similar kind of background so women from ethnic minorities who mm-hmm. are i think who are just like ordinary women but nobody pays attention to um yeah. i mean that's a fact you know it, it it's just a fact they they work hard and they kind of a lives are shaped by their um by the families and by the you know the their cultural expectations course, yeah. and then kind of uh, they do everything for that plus they expected to have a career but still they are not allowed to dream or fulfill their aspir- own aspirations or mm. you know they even though they work they're working uh, for a means to an end rather than an aspiration mm. so So I so I was really pumped up by the time I finished that leadership course I was so excited I was like yes I've got to change the world and I'm going to you know <coughs> or change my corner of the world that's how I'd like to think of it I was yeah. really pumped up got all this and people were so excited for me they were like yes you know like the women that I've already worked with on a voluntary basis I do some work so they were all like yeah 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 go for it go for it go for it so i went for it but i was determined not to start a charity uh because i know the complexity of a charity you know you yeah. you got to have your board and you've got all that stuff and it kind of uh, detracts from what you're trying to achieve sometimes mm-hmm. uh, because there's more people and then you're kind of feeding a system so there's a lot of energy going in feeding the system and not in in the doing and you know so i just didn't want to go down that route now if i had gone down that route i would have been like may not be having this conversation with you because there's funding available there's people, everybody wants to do where do it if it's altruistic yeah mm-hmm. but they don't want to do it if they don't want to invest in it if it's just a person like i'm a private limited i've registered as a private limited company mm. and i'm not making i have not made any profit whatsoever because i said my first couple of years is just trying to establish myself and yeah. prove to people that it works just to add in from there so right now are you full time on your own business is that correct yeah, yeah. and um again obviously if you don't feel comfortable sharing this this is completely fine but how how many kind of like kind of what's your what's your revenue right now as as the company <laughs> so, so you could tell me question. you could tell me like roughly how much you're making um if anything and it's okay I'll, if not oh no i'll tell you <laughs> because it's such a small number that i'm not sure to share um it's 700 quid i've got in my bank account at the moment Mm-hmm. um and because initially in the first year i got a few through my own contacts mm. i got a few pieces of work so i did the leadership program for um like a lancashire bme network i've done some for like rochdale mind i've done mm. some training for them i've done like governance reviews for small charities um which all paid a little bit yeah. which was fine <laughs> but then 
it was it's after that those were like through my contacts like people I've worked with locally here yeah but after that I've you know not been able to just get a paying opportunity people want me to speak if it's free yeah. people want me to mm-hmm. speak if watch people if it's free the women who want my coaching are women who really can't afford it and I know they can't because they're on benefits or they're on um you know they don't have money so so for them i run what i call like um pay what you can kind of a thing so yeah. they just you know i say if you think our sessions worth a cup of coffee <laughs> then pay me that you know yeah. whatever it is and i said when you're rich and famous then you can like you know compensate me but yeah. while all that is, you know i love doing that but i can't sustain it financially yeah um my husband i've got a husband who's financially uh helping me but there's only so long he can do it before yeah. you know i've got to yeah, do something the only reason why i'm asking this is because sometimes and i'm not saying that this is your case but sometimes individuals uh kind of have this baton passed to them and they feel this big calling to start their own start their own business which is great but the reality of can you afford to to pay your rent and if the answer is no then maybe you can convert it to working full time or part time and still run the business right in parallel just because it's incredibly diff- difficult to start from zero especially when um it kind of kicks in month 2 month 3 and the motivation yeah. of kicking it off starts to wear off yeah. so it's great to know initially that Yeah. it doesn't matter what kind of support i think the the partnership of a husband wife um is always helpful so it, it gives you that space to to kind of relax to find your mm-hmm. footing um so that's a really really good start uh, I, i guess um knowing that that's the situation and, and and naturally you're wanting to find more paid opportunities what would kind of like is there anything else that you're wanting to achieve in this engagement like what does success look like after these four sessions what, what do you feel like you'll feel what you feel like you'll see what you feel like you'll do differently is if i'm able to call someone like a cold call and i'm able to actually say what i offer mm. and feel comfortable with that um i think that would be success for me because you know i've never worked in sales and i've never I have and I've always hated this concept of cold calling sales and I'm yeah. warming up to the idea that it's not me forcing them it's me making them aware of what I have to offer because if yeah. they don't know where I am then they're not going to know that they need me so mm-hmm. you know that I'm there so it's not me so I'm trying to reconcile that that concept in my head but if mm-hmm. I can get comfortable to just know who to contact because I have I've got LinkedIn and I go into LinkedIn and I'm like got this uh, sales navigator that you know they're um, yeah they've got, got like that a thing yeah and then so you look at who's who and where and how do you contact them but I'm never sure about who to contact so sometimes I just have done in the past contacted people mm. but I never get a reply but then i have like people contact me saying we can do this lead generation for you yeah uh, which you know will help um but even that i'm not comfortable with because i feel like then it just i don't know that so if i get clarity on all of that thinking and have maybe like a, just a little plan on how i'm going to approach this yeah um, because at the moment it's just all through research and you know just reading online and talking to a few people but i've not had any like dedicated support as such yeah i think it's always hard starting something on your own um because i think sometimes there's skewed um ideas of of the kind of return on investment that you'll get in the sense of if you send one message you think oh well i typically respond to messages therefore they will typically respond to messages and what you find it's never that case right i've um, 
there was one task when I was starting out, I downloaded my entire Facebook friends list and I messaged each of them. So Facebook friends are a bit skewed, right? I don't know a hundred percent all of them, but you know, you know them, right? So I had 700 friends. I messaged 200 of them and two replied with real things, right? So when it comes to messaging for, for company stuff, and these are people that know me, right? So they know me straight away. Now think of someone that doesn't know me. It might have been one person, right? So I think the, the one kind of side to this and, and something in sales, sales is never ending. It, it is really hard. It's super sucky, uh, but it's a part of the, the job of, a, of an entrepreneur. And right now you're going to be everything. So you're going to be the sales. You're going to be the kind of the technical person. You're going to be the manager. Uh, and until you get to a certain level, then you can start shifting off sales. So one, I would say grit is literally the characteristic that needs to be the foundation of everything you do. And basically that is the thing that's um, just going to give the right perspective. So you don't get necessarily so caught up in people not replying. It sucks because I've gone through that and realize actually after sending 200 messages, I actually spent 200 emails and zero people replied. So again, it's a case of just being completely fine, mindset wise, completely fine when people don't reply. Typically, it takes five or six messages for them to reply, right? If, if that's your kind of um, the actual game that you're playing, then you know, okay, cool. This is the first one. So it's fine. I'm not expecting them to reply until message number five, right? So I think it then calms the whole situation down, which then you'll perform better because you're more relaxed mm -hmm. because you know, out of 700 people, two people will, will reply. And out of those replies, it might have taken me five messages to one person. So if you already know that that is broadly speaking the the kind of the the case, then you're more relaxed and you'll just be better in, in whatever you do. I think coming to the uh, the cold calling again, it's important one to know what you're selling and be confident in that. But more so, like r right now, we've literally spent like twenty minutes talking, and already I know you're very personable, right? Um, and I think it's more a case of making friends, right? Making connections. And if you bring it to that level, there's less pressure of like, I need to sell this thing. Just be like, find out what, what they're up to um, and, and find out how you can help them rather than figure out where does this thing fit into your system? Um, there's, I'm not sure if you're familiar with a film called Wolf of Wall Street. Um, it's about, uh, yeah. So the guy mm -hmm. in that film, he used to sell uh, meat door to door. And what he, his technique was, he went to a door and he said, hey, my name's Jason Belford. I sell meat to your neighbors. I've got some meat in the van. Would you like to take a look? And, and the simplicity of that is one, the social credibility of I sell to your neighbors. Mm -hmm. And two, he doesn't even do sales. He literally, he doesn't do the sales pitch of like, oh, this meat is incredible. It's 28 days old. He just says, are you interested? Now, if they say yes or no, he can then quickly move on. So it's about more so finding people that are open to the idea, have played with these concepts before, recognize the value. Those are the individuals you want to be speaking to. Uh, but until that happens, you don't need to be salesy. You can just be like, hey, I offer this. Are you interested? Yes, no, cool, move on. And then it can be uh, yeah. kind of a little bit more lighter. So you don't feel like you need to do the big sales, um, a kind of a big sales call or, or kind of really elongate it. Yeah. It can be much, much lighter. And it doesn't necessarily then have to be a call. Your first initial contact might be by email. And yes, you're sending out hundreds of emails, but at least then you can feel like you're getting some motion. And it's all about um, momentum, really. It just mm. takes time. I, as you already know, one person yeah. might not reply and that's okay. Just message them again, message them again, message, you know, until you get a no, basically. And there's some mechanisms that we can put in place to, to automate some of that um, and kind of craft that a little bit. But what you could start out is potentially you might feel the best messages like, hey, my name's this, I've worked with these clients you know, I provide these services. Would this be of interest to you? That's the first message, send. You know, that could be very quick and easy. And then you would try and find the right person. The way you find the right person is just think about who, who you've already worked with, those job titles. And I think your personal network, again, I think people are afraid of using their personal network 
again because it's like well this is your job now so you need to kind of fly the nest well actually your personal network will probably carry on providing a lot of source of work so don't don't be ashamed to kind of like carry on using that mechanism um because i, I found that <clears throat> i wanted to do a clean cut between like this new stuff over here and the existing stuff but it's much easier yeah. to get an existing client to to do another job with you or another project with you than get a new a fresh new client it's just easier so actually maybe it's 80 20 so maybe it's not necessarily a case of all of your time and resources are in new work and new clients but maybe it is a case of building more rapport with who you already have trying to see if you can jump across departments within the same organization and that stuff as well what, what out of those kind of things kind of jump out to, to you and I think resonate yeah I think that um like I like the idea of just contacting and checking and if they are not interested moving on to the next rather than getting stuck in that moment and like feeling <laughs> feeling the moment and I know, you know exactly and, yeah <laughs> yeah I know exactly what you mean because okay. I, I I felt that too you know yeah and I think I was uh, I am getting a bit better at that because like I've because I come my experience has been re of recent in the charity sector. Mm. I ended up looking for like tenders for consultants for different pieces of work. And I should know uh, that they wouldn't likely to take someone like me, A, because I don't have a track record. And that's one thing that they always want is a track record of yeah. you, have you delivered this and what is the contingency because I don't have a contingency in resources there's just me um and i've started adding my husband on as a contingency no he can do the job so not yeah. he's just genuinely can do it but and, yeah and so hard. so i <laughs> but i know that so i know that i don't know why i've spent so much of time maybe because it was familiar but i'm still getting rejections from that and mm. I know I should stay detached, but I don't know it's something about rejections that really like make you question it, you know, am I doing this? And but I know there's no turning back for me. There's no I have to make this work one way or the other. Yeah. Um I, I think rejection is forever difficult. Like uh, it's it's human. It's human to feel a bit upset and a bit, you know, demotivated. That that's literally human. So it's not as if you're like, I'm feeling something that I shouldn't. It's fine. But all it's a case of is over time, it will get lighter because you just recognize that they're not saying to you personally. They're not yeah. saying, you know, that you're not good enough. And I think it's about remembering that, you know, in the same way, when someone asks you, do you want a cup of tea? And you say, no, it, it fine. Okay. Cool. I can move on. Right. I can serve someone else. You know, so ultimately it's in getting a no. It's helpful because then you you know that you can move on and maybe come back to them in six months. You know, so in some ways, it's just a case of framing it in a more positive way. And no is really helpful because it helps you identify where to spend your time, <laughs> which is which is, again, difficult to kind of feel right. It's difficult to feel. Yeah. just kind of like I know these half an hour go at these half an hours go quite quickly. But I think kind of two things um, just to kind of like wrap up a little bit would be great to find out and then what i can do uh, retrospectively is send a couple of um, book suggestions over it'd be great to know like firstly how do you like to convey ideas so do you prefer video do you prefer uh, and like speaking do you prefer writing um, or do you just prefer like audio only in conveying ideas and then how do you like taking in ideas so do you like listening to audio books do you like reading physical books do you like watching youtube videos so kind of the two sides well i usually like writing um mm -hmm. when i convey an idea only because it gives me time to think and i'm not like on you know i can frame it properly um mm -hmm. but i've never tried like maybe i should try some of the stuff you've mentioned because mm -hmm. because I, so, I was just thinking from the perspective of people who receive my message might receive it in different like it in different ways yeah but anyway yeah what about taking um, in information how do you like taking, taking in information 
I like reading. I've got mm-hmm. lots of lots of books that I read. Uh, but I also like YouTube videos, audiobooks. I try to the podcast, I try to do a bit of all of them so that I can take in as much as I can. Yeah. Um yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. completely fine. Uh, that's good to know. Because basically my preference is I prefer speaking to communicate and I prefer listening. Uh, to taking in so I have some uh, audiobooks that have come to mind just while we've been speaking that might be helpful around the sales stuff um, and a little bit around um, kind of the grit idea because I think the grit idea allows you to kind of overcome the the re- rejection side just because it gives perspective of you know failure that really is you'll never hit failure because it's about giving up and you're never going to give up because you're going to exhibit grit and and continue so there's a couple of books that have come to mind and um what i'll do is i'll send them over after this and it'd be great if we can book in next week so you can use the same calendly link again and if you just book another half an hour for for next week we can keep the momentum up yeah okay yeah Awesome. Well, this is always going to be a context setting meeting and there'll be more meat on the bone as we speak through the next kind of three sessions. But it was really good chatting to you anyway and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for listening and please do get in contact if you've took anything away from this. Contact Dan on any of his social media sites as he would be interested to know what your takeaways were from this. Right, enjoy the rest of your day and see you soon.